tuned in to The Andrew Lawton Show. Welcome back to The Andrew Lawton Show. Uh, Just to bring you up to speed, if you haven't been following this in the last few months, in March, a law that the government passed just under two years ago will go into effect, which will mean that people who have only a mental illness will be eligible for state-facilitated assisted suicide. So the government will kill you if you are dealing with a serious mental illness, as evidenced by the fact that you want someone to kill you. This is something that I've talked about as being near and dear to my heart as a survivor of suicide, someone who's been through mental illness. And as this has been discussed, we've seen more and more horror stories of people that have called up the Veterans Affairs Support Hotline because they need some form of assistance and are instead told to consider ending their lives. People that need a mechanical chairlift that uh, want a mechanical chairlift and think maybe the government can give them some assistance in getting it are and are instead told perhaps you need medical assistance in dying to use the government's euphemism and so on this is becoming a bit of a problem in canada which has a larger rate of these state facilitated deaths than similar jurisdictions with similar laws which means perhaps there is a culture of death in canada that the liberal government has allowed to take hold and that certainly a large number of canadian doctors are allowing to take hold, but not all of them. And I'm very glad that there is some pushback here, including, I'd say, a a growing movement of people that are are not even ideologically against assisted dying, but don't like how the government has opened the floodgates in the way it has. Nicole Scheidel is the Executive Director of Canadian Physicians for Life and joins me now. Nicole, it's good to talk to you. Thanks for coming on today. Thank you for having me, Andrew. So obviously there, there's been such tremendous attention in the last few weeks, in the last couple of months in particular here, but I know your group and a lot of other physicians have really been sounding the alarm about this for, for quite some time. So why has it taken so long for there to actually be, in your view, some more public attention to this? Honestly, I think it's the media that has now been paying attention to the stories that are out there and reporting them. And that has come to the attention of the government in a way that was not happening before. They were not really listening to the dis- the disabled community. There was lots of groups, disability groups, who were talking very loudly about Bill C-7 as it went through and their concerns. And I think part of it was because of the lockdown over COVID and the virtual parliament. It was very hard to get the attention of the parliamentarians. But now that the House is back in session, people are back in Ottawa, the media is um, maybe not so focused on COVID and looking at some of the other issues that are happening. And these kinds of stories are now starting to come to the surface. And I think that's what's causing the government to have some pause in what they're doing. I know when assisted dying laws first came in in Canada to allow it, there was this concern that a lot of people raised, and myself among them, that there was going to be that slippery slope. And we were told, no, no, it's not going to be like that. It's going to be very rare. It's going to be very tightly controlled. And we're seeing now that the slippery slope was very real. And I I think it's actually gone even a lot further than uh, some of the more cynical critics of this had argued. When you have people that are uh, going through this process because their issue is not even medical, but it's related to affordable housing, for example. Yeah, no, certainly. And I think it's happened with such a speed in Canada that um, it's pretty hard to argue that there wasn't a slippery slope. I think one of the other things that we're seeing is just the impact of proposed changes in the law. So we have psychiatrists who are now telling us that they have patients who are refusing treatment because they know that euthanasia will be open to them as suffering from just simply a medical, uh, mental condition as a soul. Um, issue for euthanasia. And so now they're refusing treatment because that's what they're aiming towards. Explain to me, if you can, where some of the doctors that are more activist in nature are on this, because it it seems like uh, on one hand, you've got a lot of doctors that are are uncomfortable with this, that aren't necessarily pro-life or or particularly political on this. But you also have a subset that really seem to believe, from my assessment anyway, that assisted suicide is a right. And who is anyone else to tell you you shouldn't be able to avail yourself of it? Well, and I think there are some 
physicians who are very enthusiastic about euthanasia and assisted suicide as the best way to die. And so they are seeing that as the solution to many of societal ills, that the best way to relieve suffering is to get rid of the sufferer. Yeah, and there, there was this piece in the Daily Mail, when, since you bring that up. Uh, one doctor says, it's the most rewarding work we've ever done. This is a physician, uh, well, two physicians in the article, Ellen Weeb and, and Stephanie Green of, of Dying with Dignity Canada, who say they have uh, euthanized more than 700 people between them. So to them, it's almost like this tally. The more people they've been able to uh, do this to, it, it, the more people they've been able to help. Well, I think that's certainly how they square it with their conscience, that that is what they're doing. Uh, the question is, how careful have they been in really assessing people? You saw in that story, there was a story of one of Ellen Weeb's patients who she assessed virtually, had the man fly out to her place of work in BC, and she euthanized him out there. And so I would think it's pretty challenging for a physician to do a proper assessment on something that is as serious as this in a virtual manner. I, I guess the, the question that I would ask then is where is it going from here? Because if we're already, you know, barreling down the slippery slope, as we were talking about earlier, what's the next frontier? Because I, I think we've seen that it's very easy to get into a point where you're playing catch up here. And in the case of, of the mental health exemption, we're looking at that deadline, which unless uh, they, they do go forward with the changes is going to be in, in March. What's the next thing that people need to be worried about or watch out for? Well, I think it's pretty clear that the two other issues that are on the table are advanced directives. So individuals, particularly aimed towards those with dementia, can pre-choose their death date, and then it's pretty hard for them to step away from it. And then also um, euthanizing infants and children. I think that's the other area that's going to expand. And we've already seen um, the College of Quebec, for example, the Phys College of Physicians of Quebec, speaking about euthanizing infants. Um, we have seen um, the sick kids has put out a policy for how they would treat um, assisted dying with minors and how they would choose that and how they would work through that. So I think that is something that um, is already being considered within the medical community or within particular parts of the medical community. Now, th this goes beyond conscience rights, does it not? I mean, physicians are not being forced to do this, as I understand, correct? So in Ontario, they are being uh, forced to refer. So that's a question of um, conscience rights there. I think nurses as well are being forced to participate when they don't want to. I think it's becoming pretty, it's, the problem is, is that because the focus is so much on if a patient says they want it, you must facilitate it. There's no opportunity to go into the why. And most individuals who say, oh, I want to die, what they really want is they want their situation to change. And so if a physician can't speak to them and find out what's at the root of this and see if they can fix it, then there's no opportunity for the system or even the doctors involved or the nurses to have a conversation with the patient in a way that tries to resolve their issues rather than just um, putting them on the euthanasia train and, and reaching out to the MAID team and having euthanasia provided pretty quickly. I know when medicinal marijuana was becoming a bit more of a thing and we didn't have legalized cannabis in Canada, there was this this little whisper campaign that was sort of going on where people that wanted a prescription knew where to go. And there were certain doctors that were a little bit more liberal with writing these prescriptions than others. And, and in many cases, more liberal than the legislation. And the sense that I've gotten anecdotally is that the same thing has been true in, in assisted dying is that you have the, the regulations and the standards that are supposed to be there, but uh, there are certain places that people go that might be a bit more lax with it. And even between provinces, I mean, I, I I've understood and I've known personally people that have been eligible in British Columbia that uh, never would have been eligible in another province. Yeah, no, it's certainly, I mean, even though it is a federal system or a framework, there are different or varying interpretations of it in different areas of the country, but certainly it comes down to what one doctor believes is uh, acceptable. 
And you will even see in the reports with and um, of Ellen Weave, and she has said, like, if I believe that it's right, then I will do it. And so I think what you're seeing is doctor shopping happening. And even in the um, training that they do in CAM app, so the Canadian Association of Made Professionals, um, that they have talked about, if you get a no, you can keep looking. So there's no kind of um, suggestion that if some if doctors say that you are not eligible, that that is the end of the story. You can keep doctor shopping. You can keep looking for a doctor who's going to agree with your assessment. I, we wouldn't accept that in medicine with someone that wanted a prescription for opioids, would we? No. I mean, I think that's pretty clear. Even with um, other procedures, if a doctor determines that you're not eligible or it's not appropriate treatment, generally that's where it stops. I mean, you can ask for a second opinion in some cases, but you don't get third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth opinions. It's baffling to me that so many people ha have been basically cowed into silence on on some of these things. And again, we, we talked about this at the beginning. There's a little bit of a turning point here and that more people are paying attention to this now than, than were before. Let me ask about the middle ground, if you will, because obviously your group represents doctors who are, are tremendously uh, passionate about life issues, and I, I'm so grateful we have them. And I, I think, though, there are other doctors that would probably not identify as pro-life. They wouldn't identify, identify as conservative, but they are very uncomfortable with where this is going. And I, I'm curious how large or small a group that is in your view. I would think that it's the majority of doctors who are concerned that... Um, it's gone too far. I, I think also, honestly, many physicians were not paying attention to this. Many mm. Canadians were not paying attention to this. Bill C-7 kind of slipped under the radar during COVID. And all of a sudden, doctors are finding that their patients can request um, euthanasia, even if they have something, a treatable symptom. I mean, you saw that whole story that blew up around the young man who had diabetes and was then... Um, he was able to get a, an assisted death date and his mother found out and took it to the media and made a big um, to do about it. And then the doctor pulled out. Right. And since then, if you listen to other stories and followed him since then, he uh, went on a date, had a got a girlfriend, his life changed. He didn't want to die anymore. And so you really start to question whether people who are in these situations, what we really need to do is change their circumstances. And then um, assisted death is not on the table for them. So just as a matter of logistics here, I know that we have this deadline uh, that's supposed to kick in in March. The government has talked about postponing it. Where are things now? Well, so March 17th is the sunset clause. So the law already exists. It just means it will go into effect March 17th. They would have to bring forward legislation. Uh, the House does not sit now till the end of January. So I'd be surprised if they could bring forward legislation fast enough and move it through the process before um, the sunset clause happens. Um, I'm happy to be surprised, but um, you know, they have to, I think it would have to move through the House and the Senate with unanimous consent. And that aspect of the law was put into place by the Senate. Um, they wanted to um, allow euthanasia for individuals whose sole condition was mental illness. So I'd be surprised if there was any change to the law. Yeah. And, and again, the whole basis of this was just trust us to figure it out, which I didn't uh, particularly trust them two years ago when they made that comment. And I, I really don't now that we're heading towards it. And and I, I think that the challenge here is that there are so many situations where, and this is what comes up whenever abortion is raised as an issue, for example, uh, as most people listening to this show will probably know, and many Canadians don't likely know is that Canada has no law on abortion and abortion is legal in Canada up until seconds before delivery. And whenever this issue is raised, people say, well, you know, we, we just trust doctors to make the right call. We we trust doctors to not be irresponsible with this. But the, the problem is, is that as we've talked about, there's a wild variation in what doctors in this country view as being acceptable. Certainly. And there's also, I would say, 
particularly with euthanasia, there's no oversight. So there's no group or body that goes through and makes sure things were done properly. And so it's very problematic because the euthanasia providers are saying, oh, there's never been any, um, nothing has ever gone wrong, right? There's been no reported cases of anything uh, that's ever gone amiss. And that's just not true, first of all. And secondly, you have you don't have the um, reporting mechanisms to ensure that that's the case. And so I think it's uh, naive to suggest that the body that's um, providing euthanasia should be the one that's doing the oversight and the reporting on it. And But that's how it's been set up in Canada. And the government is certainly funding the group that does euthanasia. They just gave them another $3 million plus dollars. Um, so I think it's a concern when the government's putting a lot of resources into providing assisted suicide, but not a similar amount of resources into palliative care or into social supports or into other things that help people um, live well. Yeah, uh, this is uh, an important topic. We'll continue to follow it. Nicole Scheidel is the executive director of Canadian Physicians for Life. Uh, just on a, well, I don't want to say an unrelated note, but on a uh, slightly uh, sidestepping note here, uh, this is not a religious issue. I, I know when a lot of people hear life and pro-life, they associate it with religious arguments, and certainly there are a lot of religious people in, in the pro-life movement, but Canadian Physicians for Life is, is secular, and there are a lot of people that that have a very scientific approach to these problems, do they not? Yeah, that's absolutely correct. So our members are focused on practicing medicine in the Hippocratic tradition, so doing no harm. And I would say one of the um, most compelling arguments that I've heard against euthanasia was given by one of the doctors at our conference. And he said, if you can show me how euthanasia helps my patients, I'd be happy to um, provide it, but because it doesn't make their lives better, it doesn't heal them. It doesn't, uh, it's not part of the healing profession. I'm really not prepared to do it at this point. Yeah, very important. And I appreciate you sharing that. Nicole, thank you so much for your work on this. We'll have to touch base in the future, but sure, uh, absolutely. like I said, I, I would love to find some optimism in this, but it's hard to in the current circumstances. Well, I think that sometimes when it becomes so bad, it wakes people up and then they have to mm -hmm. say like, we need to change. And if you compare us to California, which is similar in size, we've had 10,000 deaths. They've had like 400. And so you have to ask what's wow. the difference? What's, what's going on here? Terrible stuff. Nicole, thank you very much. Happy new year to you. You too. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Andrew Lawton show. Support the program by donating to true North at www.tnc.news.